Ukraine has left its mark on the world that something you can feel is probably felt most strongly now in Moscow. That was Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky as he was pleading for additional U.S. military aid in a speech Monday at the National Defense University in Washington, part of an 11th hour effort this week to secure more funding before the U.S. runs out of money for the war in Ukraine, a war that even some members of the U.S. Congress now admit is unwinnable. This was one such member, Republican Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio, this past weekend. Zelensky comes to town and demands that you give him, the American taxpayer gives him another $61 billion. And oh, by the way, if you want to secure your border first, you are actually a Putin puppet. He said this publicly today. I think it's disgraceful. I think it's grotesque. And I think that it comes at a time when Republicans are actually showing some unity and some courage about the importance of the American southern border. So this is purely designed to apply pressure on Republicans to give up their fight on the border and write another blank check to Ukraine. Poor results and Kiev's so-called counteroffensive against Russia this past year, along with increasing problems in getting funds from Congress, according to a piece in the New York Times Monday, are forcing a rethink of military strategy for the entire conflict. For more on that, we go to Moscow to speak with analyst Mark Sloboda. Mark? There's an article out in the New York Times, U.S. and Ukraine search for a new strategy after failed counteroffensive. Um, and uh, one of the things they argue is that the U.S., uh, part of what uh, the Pentagon is advising uh, the Kiev regime now, uh, after their last advice for the summer offensive went so well, is that they want Ukraine to fight Russia on a tight budget. <laughs> so uh, all the, the the hundred billion they spent so far to produce this, uh, you know, uh, giant uh, NATO proxy, NATO train, NATO armed, um, NATO planned offensive with with troops supposedly, um, you know, trained to NATO standards to fight in the NATO combined arms maneuver warfare way. Uh, and uh, it, it completely failed. Uh, so now they want them to defend, uh, to go on defense for, well, at least the next year, possibly more, and to do it on a tighter budget. Look, um, I'm going to say something about tight budgets, okay? Just for some context, prior to the beginning of the operation in February of 2022, Russia's annual military budget was somewhere around $70 billion, 65 to $70 billion, while the U.S. military budget was just reaching the $800 billion mark. Um, certainly, Russia's upped its uh, military budget while it's been engaged in a war with NATO on its borders, but it is nowhere near even the amount of money that the U.S. sent to Ukraine, let alone the military budget of the NATO countries. And so th th they're spending already 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 against Russia and losing, and now they want to talk about tight budgets. <laughs> yeah, uh, do more with less. Or, or you know, uh, considering that more is already, I don't know, you failed so far with a bigger budget, so try failing less with a smaller budget. Anyway, it's a recognition of two things. One is the political problems, the speed bump that the Biden administration is going through uh, with the uh, Republicans in the House as they attempt to leverage this tight situation um, purely for petty domestic political reasons uh, to demand uh, border security and immigration policy changes before they uh, release uh, the Ukraine aid flow again. Uh, and they've been quite clear that that's a, a very specific horse trade. Uh, and I believe eventually the Biden administration will collapse on that. But they're certainly taking it to the line. And and the, I have to admit the, the GOP is as well with even, you know, uh, decades long Russophobes like Lindsey Graham, Mitch McConnell um, and Mitt Romney 
uh, agreeing to this strategy to to push the administration to the line on this in order to get the the funding for his proxy war. So that's interesting. Uh, but I'm sure they'll get it eventually, even if it it's, uh, comes late in February. It's also a recognition that going forward, getting more money will be even harder, right? Um, and it's a recognition also, I think more importantly, that the U.S. military industrial complex uh, right. is not capable of supplying the Kiev regime what they need, right? Uh, I've been saying this for uh, essentially uh, over a year, like a year and a half now, as has Brian Berletic at the New Atlas and a few others, that this is a war of attrition fought largely with artillery and in the production of artillery shells and numerous other uh, types of, of armaments and weapons for this land-centric war of attrition in Eurasia, the U.S. military industrial complex is just not geared up to fight this. Um, and that they do not have an easy way of um, ramping up without huge new long-term contracts, which no NATO countries, not the U.S., not European countries, are willing to do to make it profitable for them to hire tons of new people and open new factories and new supply chains and everything else, which would take years uh, anyway. Uh, they've been geared up towards um, uh, fighting uh, low-level counterinsurgency wars of uh, hegemony across the Islamic world for a few decades and high-end boondoggles like the F-35 and the littoral combat ship, and they're just not prepared for this type of conflict, which is why the New York Times finally admitted a couple months ago uh, in an article, uh, Russia overcomes sanctions to expand missile production, officials say. It actually goes into a lot more than just that. And they talk about how Russia has dramatically increased production of uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, drones, tanks, you know, uh, everything and artillery. And they admit that in artillery shells, Russia is produce, outproducing not just the U.S., not just all of NATO together, but all of NATO put together by seven times. Right. And against it on the other side, the Times says, this is a quote, they're asking for millions of rounds of artillery, for example, from Western stockpiles that do not exist. Yeah, that's the other side of this New York Times article that's coming out. So uh, evidently, uh, Lloyd Austin went back to Zeluzhny. He's like, oh, all right, all right. So that, that offensive we planned didn't work out. So what do you need to win the war? Uh, and this is reported in the Ukrainian media, right? Uh, Ukraine's Kapravda. Um, and uh, uh, Zeluzhny told him, I need 17 million artillery shells. Right. And three hundred and fifty to four hundred billion dollars worth of military hardware on top of that. OK. And Lloyd Austin's like. Seventeen million, one hundred and fifty five millimeter artillery shells, that doesn't exist in the world. That's more than several years. <laughs> it's nowhere even close. All right? The U.S. scrambled to pull 300,000 artillery shells from South Korea for the last offensive because they had mm -hmm. already burnt through their own stockpiles. No one, no one, not only do they not have this, no one has this and no one even, you know, in a few years has the ability to produce that. I actually think that's Zeluzhny's way of saying uh, there's nothing we can do to win this war. And at the same time, the Financial Times came out with an article today as Zelensky is in Washington. Ukrainians question Volodymyr Zelensky's rose-tinted speeches. And if you read through the article, it is a tacit admission that pretty much everything the Kiev regime has been saying about this war is a lie, that it's complete propaganda meant to keep Ukrainians fighting and uh, conscripted and fighting, and that it is time for Zelensky to uh, inject some realism because he's no longer credible. And considering the entirety of the Western mainstream media has just been repeating what the Kiev regime right. says uncritically for the last two years, uh, they you guys have all lost credibility too. And then finally, the... Uh 
parry to the thrust of the U.S. Uh, and of Zelensky right now against uh, the holdouts in Congress uh, is the delegation coming from Hungary to speak with uh, folks at a uh, Heritage Foundation conference. Yes, and they'll be arguing that the U.S. should not give any more money or arms to Ukraine and should be trying for some type of diplomatic settlement instead, which I have to admit, saying that in Washington will just be like speaking, a, well, it'll be like speaking Hungarian, a foreign language that they just don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even but, have but, any translators for. But but it is being spoken, and that, that that is new in this whole in this whole process. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll speak with you again next week. Thanks for having me. For KPFK, I'm Don DeBar.